All right. So you work in the lighting and grip department. Uh, refresh my memory. You're also part of the IATSE union, correct? I am. I am part of IATSE 873. I was a part of NABET as well uh, for a few years. Uh, and then before that, I was a part of the independent industry, whether that would be short films, music videos, commercials, and that type of thing. So I've kind of daisy chain and jumped from one thing to another over the years. Cool. And um, if you don't mind me asking, um, what made you want to change from NABET to IATSE? If you don't want to answer that question, that's fine. Um, let's see here. How do I not put, uh, put myself in hot water later? Um, one of, one of the, the two biggest reasons for wanting to, to, to change, uh, was I really wanted to try and have a better work life balance. Uh, and I actually offered that a lot more than what NABET had to offer. And so, uh, that was a really big uh, decision to make. I had a lot of really good uh, friends, a lot of uh, really good technicians and people I've been working to for years in NABET. Like it's a great union. There's a lot of really good people, got a lot of really good shows, but uh, where I was in my life, I needed a better work-life balance. And so that was a really big um, uh, point for why I wanted to change. Um, also, I actually just gets the bigger shows. They have bigger budgets. They get more toys to play with. And so for myself, like I, I'm a lighting tech. I love, I love building stuff. I like being creative. I like, I like uh, just, just like the rigs that we get to build in IATSE are just a, a lot bigger, a lot more challenging. Uh, and so that was another reason I was like, I want to be challenged a little bit more. I want to have a little bit more fun with some of these types of uh, projects and shows and just having the budgets to be able to do it. And so uh, those were the two, two main reasons for wanting to kind of change over from uh, NABET to IATSE. So um, from your uh, experience working in the lighting and uh... Sorry, my brain just had a brain fart there. Lighting and grip department. I almost said lighting and tech department. I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> um, the question that I have here is, um, are uh, what are some aspects or realities of working in your department that you want individuals to know who are considering a career in that department? That that like that they wouldn't learn in in school that you think they wouldn't learn in school. Yeah, I. I mean, like this is this is a really good question, and it's really everybody's going to take this answer potentially a little bit differently depending on who they are. But really, at the end of the day, the film industry is one where the more you put out, the more you're going to get back at the end of the day, right? If you can handle criticism or if you can own your mistakes, the more people are going to be willing to help you and show you and train you in the industry in, in particularly the field that you want to do. If you continue to like, no, I never did it. Don't own your mistakes. Continue to blame everybody else. You continue to like not put yourself out there and always wait for somebody else to call you. I mean, at the end of the day, like, if that's the attitude that you're going into the industry with, then that's generally what you're going to kind of get back out of it. And so, you know, being able to use some of the gear, being able to uh, make some of the connections uh, at the end of the day is you're going to learn some of that in, in, in your school. But I mean, when you come on set, you know, we're looking for, are you a hard worker? Can you take criticism? Are you willing to put yourself out there at the end of the day? Like how hard are you going to hustle? Right. And we're looking for that at the end of the day, I can teach you a lot of the other type of stuff, but I can't teach you those, those things. I can't teach you those, those factors. And so really that's what we're kind of looking for. If you really want to exceed and excel, like you could not know anything, but if you have those character traits, oh boy, you're going to go really far. And that's not in the grip of money department. That's any of the departments in the film industry as a general, if you have that type of mentality, you're going to go someplace. Definitely. Yeah. As soon as, like, as you said, it's all about how you take uh, criticism and everything. I'm like, oh, my brain just jumped a whole bunch of memories. <laughs> and, it, it, and, and that's hard, right? Like, like, everybody doesn't want to own their mistakes, right? Nobody wants to own that. Like, that's in general, right? But we find a lot of times on a film set that being able to own your mistakes can be a defining character of who you are. Right. And a lot of people will know if you're owning it or if you're if if you're trying to escape, go around anybody with over years worth of experience in the industry is going to know if you're trying to get out of it or not. So if everybody knows if you're lying or not, just own it. And really, at the end of the day, the amount of trouble you get 
into is really minute. I mean, like there are always circumstances where, yeah, things do happen. But I would say a large percentage of the occasions where you screw up, break something, make a mistake, even cost tens of thousands of dollars in damage, really at the end of the day, production just needs to know why this happens so they can move on with it. They're not necessarily, most of the time, we're not looking for an scapegoat to blame, like other, other uh, industries and stuff like that. It's really just like, oh, okay, well, this is why this happened. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, let's keep filming. But it normally we just want to just naturally, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to look bad. I don't want to, I don't want to blame. But really you actually look better when you own your mistakes because the people around you can outtrust you. And when people trust you, they want to work with you. When they want to work with you, oh, great. Now we've got tomorrow's job. Yes. And uh, yeah, I've, um, yeah, this, holy crap. Sorry. My brain just went a mile a minute. My mouth could not catch up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I've, uh, from the past conversations that I've had with others who have reached out because they see on social media, what I have to offer, um, they will ask a similar question and I go, you know, because there's uh like there's film uh sorry, there's uh there's crew members that are a little bit old school, and then there's crew members that they're more flexible in how they look at how the film industry has changed. And so <clears throat> and so I've told them that um if you're not so sure about something, you know, say it, but you probably will occasionally work for someone who will basically make you feel bad about not knowing something. And, uh, and so at that point, you just have to make up your mind about how you want to react to that kind of negativity. Absolutely. Uh, and, uh, cause yeah. And so, um, uh, I, I think I've said in the past that if you are asking a question for, for clarification, or if you really don't know, and then you find out the hard way that the person above you just wants to make you feel bad because that's how they were taught or whatever the case may be, then you make a mental note for, okay, if I have any other questions, don't ask this person ask the person either above them or someone who's on the same level. And it's, I think at that point, you're just in survival mode to be, I'm not entirely, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not entirely uh, seasoned with this aspect of the job. Um, you know, can you just give me like, you know, uh, be more- well, and, and and that's where like the job is almost 75% politics. Like it's brutal these days. It, it really is so much of your job is politics and such a small bit of a percentage of your job is actually doing the actual work. Because like you said, like you will find people out there that are going to criticize you for making a mistake or even criticize you for not asking. Like you're in a no win-win situation and you're going to learn really fast. Oh, this is the crew. This is the key. These are the people I don't want to work with. It's not like the industry was like 10 years ago where we only had five or six different crews out there. There's so much more work now out there to have. And so because of that, you now have more options of who I'm going to work with. And so because of that, like when you call in to, to, to take a job as a permit or something like that, and they're like, oh, this show with this crew, you have the ability to turn that down. Or if you don't, you go out on that day, you already know, oh, this is somebody where I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to comment. I'm just going to do as I'm told and go for it. I myself, I still do that with some crews because it's not worth getting into with some of the people. So you just keep your head down. You do your job. You get your paycheck. You do a good job to the best of your abilities and you go home. But the great thing is even when you're doing that, the people around you, the other dailies, the other crew people pick up on that. They know your character. And so just because you're key now, you're trying to stay away from him or maybe the second or something like that. But the other people you're working with, they're still picking up on that. And they'll, you'll build trust, you'll build value, and you'll, you'll build credibility just by doing that, not saying anything. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because, yeah, I was having flashbacks to my my first show call that I think I told you about a little while ago. But, uh, yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, it's like you're, you're going to work for people that um, they will come across as being mean spirited and uh, you just got to keep your head down, keep working hard. You know, if you make a mistake one day, try not to make the same mistake the following day 
And uh, whatever you learn that day, try to remember it for the following day so that the only thing that they are coming to you for is uh, clarification for themselves even. But uh, yeah, it's, you definitely do uh, get stronger after you work on shows like this. You, you, yeah, you definitely get some thicker skin and not not to justify anybody's bad behavior in any way, shape or form. But I've, I've kind of had to learn my own self. Like, why are people like this? Why are people freaking me out? And, and you're right. There are just certain bad apples that that's just their character. That's just the way they are. You're not going to be able to do anything about it. You're not going to be able to change that. But you also do got to understand too, when you're going on out, there's like, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars being spent per hour. Your supervisor, the person above you, once again, has not justified their actions, but they have a lot of pressure on them, right? You don't know who's been barking at them. You don't know what else is going around on other locations and other departments that they're that they're logistically trying to figure out or, or balancing budgets and stuff like that. Like your small thing of, hey, I'm going to go set this up or I got to go talk to this one person could be one thing that, that your supervisor is dealing with on, on a huge scale in a very short period of time. And so once again, I'm not trying to justify their actions, but at the same time, when you find yourself in a situation like that, take a breath, take a step back, don't take it personally and realize, whoa, okay, this probably had nothing to do with me and there could be something else and walk away from it, right? So just just take, encourage to take that as a, as a consideration if you do find yourself in a situation like that. Um, so uh, the next question is uh, in terms of networking, our favorite thing to do, whether you like it or not. <laughs> uh, so in terms of networking, what advice would you give to either newcomers or aspiring filmmakers who approach a film set that's shooting on location um, and uh, they are looking for um, to make a network connection for future opportunities? without annoying the crap out of you? I mean, that's a great question, but I, I mean, huh. I mean, like with anything in the industry, it's all time and place, right? I it, It's hard to really truly even be able to give that uh, a perfect answer because I have been on, on set sometimes where, you know, I don't mind talking to somebody. Somebody comes on up and just starts asking questions and is just curious. And it's kind of a, a bit of a right place, right time, right? You're either outside or inside on location. And you're just not really doing anything, right? I, I think a lot of that question really comes down to how good are your visual people skills? Like how good are you with reading people? There are a lot of people on set that don't necessarily want to be talking to the, to the public or, or uh, when, they, when we're on location. And there are other people that really like to do it. So if you do go for it, I highly encourage you to take the initiative and go for it. But absolutely don't take it personal if somebody kind of brushes you off or says whatever. It just, it literally could just be their personality or literally could just be, once again, there's a lot of things on the go that that individual doesn't necessarily have time necessarily to be thinking about. And they just had to walk away from set because they're so stressed out, which is why you find them alone someplace else offset. Uh, you know, that, that could be a reason why. But really like, because the industry has grown so much more than where it was, the ability to network and get on sets are so much more easier now than when I first started. And so it's amazing just even networking on social media is wild. Like I still, I still just see so much activity on social media, people either talking, meeting up, asking for help and stuff like that is just for, for me that like that's a whole new new thing like I never had any of that when I first first started it was very old school networking style and so I, I strongly encourage a lot of people literally just go online go and cold call people go and cold email people just being like hey do you have work coming up do you need a PA you know I, I tell you in 100% of the times I've told somebody to do that and they did it they got work by doing that 100% of the people that didn't do that did not get a job or network with anybody. And so I, I strongly encourage people to do cold emailing, uh, cold emailing or cold phone calls to productions. Like it's amazing how many times you'll actually get work from that. Even I'll give out my, my email to somebody I haven't heard in a while. 
they'll just cold call or cold text me. And I'm in a process of hiring say 20 or 15 dailies. And I'm just like, you know what? I'll just take you just because I, I just don't have time to find somebody else. And it's just like, Oh, this is great. Perfect. One less person I need to find. You're just hired. Uh, you know, come on out type of thing. Uh, and so I, I would just really kind of strongly encourage those aspects of things. Oh man. Yeah. As soon as uh, you said um, like, Oh, I don't really have uh, a whole, uh, a whole lot of people who are available or whatnot that brought me back to roughly a month ago, maybe a little over a month ago. I, uh, I had made a connection with an AD from when I was doing background work and uh, we started talking and, you know, I mentioned to her that, you know, I'm with, the guild as an ad this is you know what i've done and everything and so i shared my information with her you know just being like hey just to you know put this into your you know into the back of your brain you know i shared with her even my my dgc profile and uh when she brought me on board uh to work crew on the show that i just done bg work that will always mess with my head it doesn't matter how many times i do it um is that uh, she told me the story of how um, they were looking for a set PA because they were going to be having a lot of background performers. I think we had like 30 or 60 background performers, but they were coming in at different times. And uh, the, uh, and they were racking their brains to try and find someone for the job. Then she goes, oh man, I forgot, Taylor. <laughs> so she, she um because I, I had contacted her to meet up for coffee because she lives um, also in the area. And... Um, but, you know, scheduling wise just wasn't working out. So it just so happened that she remembered that, oh, wait, I do know someone. Contact That's great. Me. Luckily, I was available. And um, yeah, I just went and did the job. It was for like the one day. And uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's funny doing those cold call things without also annoying the crap out of someone, especially when you well, know. That, well, that, that's where like I, I found personally like and I'll, I'll, I'll cold call or text message myself, right? Like what, if work ever runs dry, especially like over the strikes and stuff like that. I mean, I was out there cold calling people that I hadn't talked to in 10 years, you know, and, and it's one of those things and I was getting work from people that I hadn't talked to in a while. And so like, I, I share a lot in the busy season, I encourage people to uh, reach out to people about every two weeks. Uh, Cause that's generally like a bit of a cycle depending on which uh, area of the industry you're kind of in independent union and stuff like that. It does, it fluctuates between a weekly to bi-weekly cycle. And so I encourage people do it every two weeks in the off season, do it once a month and then see what you kind of get is, is been kind of more, even more my, my way I've been kind of doing it. I've kind of found that's kind of worked. And I kind of encourage a lot of other people to kind of do, do that uh, or a, a similar model as well. And that way you're not bugging them too much, but you're still kind of staying, Hey, relevant. And either they're going to hire you because they're annoyed with you, or they're going to tell you, Hey man, I'm just going to let you know when I've got work, in which case, great. You're still being remembered. So either way you're going to win. Yeah, I remember when I was uh, last year when I was uh, doing AD work for Murdoch and, you know, that topic of conversation came up, of course. And the third AD said they get a lot of people contacting them for work because work was so sparse. And um, there were still some shows that were still filming, even when the strike was uh, was still happening. And they said there was one individual who tried to guilt them into hiring them by saying, you know, like my financial situation is so bad, you know, I need to, you know, pay my bills and whatnot. And, uh, and they said, don't guilt me into hiring you because I'm not going to want to hire you if you're just going to yeah. make me feel bad about it. And so I think that's another aspect of like, it's, um, it's not the other person's job to help you with your finances. That's your job. And I know that my husband and I, we've, uh, sometimes we talk about that too. Um, whenever someone tells him, oh, I need more money. But meanwhile, they're the kind of, you know, type that doesn't really handle their finances all that well. And it's, um, it's reminding me of another podcast with another AD that said, um, don't be expecting I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's like, don't be going in there expecting something, go, like go in there offering something um, or something to that effect. But um, yeah, it's another thing that I wanted to add in there because I know a lot of people have that kind of mindset where they go, 
I'm strapped for cash, you know, all other personal stuff. And it's like, that's not really our, you know, fault. I, I, absolutely. And and I, it's funny you mentioned that because I absolutely feel the same way. If, if you try and guilt trip me, especially tell me what, what kind of situation you're in, you know, I have very little sympathy for uh, something like that. Like I started off during SARS when there was no work. I was, you know, I was working free for the first year in the industry. My first paycheck was for 50 bucks. You know, I had to hold down another job and then drive to Toronto to go and try and get something for free for those first number for the first year before I even started making money. And that money was 50 bucks when I got that first paycheck. So let your work experience speak for you. Don't ever try and guilt trip somebody in, like you said. Like it's not gonna work. It's a bad way to like actually taint your name. Cause though everybody of any influence talks to themselves, talks to uh the different people in the industry and be like, yo watch out for this guy because if you also can't handle your finances and you're, you're you're out there like that it can also taint your own reputation being like okay well how trustworthy can this guy be at the same time so it's interesting you bring that up uh that's a that's a good that's a good point yeah it just um that memory just came flooding back to my head like in regards to like reaching out for work it's like probably should add in don't be reaching out for work to try and guilt people into hiring you because you're not you know in a very good situation right now <laughs> Um, yeah, like, 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 give that individual value. Say, hey, I can work weekends. I can work nights. I don't mind working for reduced hours. Do you know anybody else that's looking for another department job? Right? Like, give them some value of why to be able to go ahead and want to hire you. You know, and what's going to put you out? Uh, what's going to? What's going to? Why are they going to want to hire you more than the next person? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, this next question is more for individuals who feel discouraged when they see a job posting that keeps specifying looking for experience this. Um, and so, you know, what kind of advice would you give to those individuals who are trying to get their foot in the door, but all they see is looking for experienced yada, yada, yada. I mean, this this does irk me a little bit. It, once again, great great question because I kind of feel the same way too. I'll see some of these job postings and be like, oh, I don't know, do I qualify for that? Am I good enough for that type of like thing? Well, what exactly are they looking for? You know, and it's amazing how many people I find get these jobs that are unqualified for it. It's incredible the people that are in uh, some sort of uh, a senior or superior ro ro role that you're going to know more than they do. And so don't let that be a reason not to do it. Apply for it. Put yourself out there. Like what we were talking about before, hustle, hustle, hustle work hard you know how are we learning we're learning on on uh, on the sets with people around ourselves right the biggest thing i would just say if you're going to apply for something that's a bit beyond your your comfort level just have an honest conversation with whoever the person is that you, that's you're looking to hire whether they're the, the dp or the production manager and something like that because it's amazing what in the times i have applied for those jobs the difference in what the job really is like compared to how they posted it can be very different. And so you can always, just because you apply for the job doesn't mean that you have to turn it down. Once again, it goes back to like your own personal personality. Can I apply for something and be humble enough to say, oh, you know what? This doesn't sound like something I feel too comfortable with. Or do you feel comfortable or is your personality type being like, yeah, you know what? I could take this on. This could be a bit of a challenge. And maybe who do I have around me that I can call and pick their brains about how to kind of be able to do that? Or who, who do I know that I can maybe hire out to kind of be, uh, help me out on this job maybe it's a job where i need to take a pay cut and pay somebody else more to be able to help me out and so those would be more my encouraging aspects of how to be able to handle a situation like that but at the end of the day go for it try it what's the worst that's going to happen they're going to say no great there's gonna be another posting next week for you to try the same thing for especially when it's busy yeah i um i'm remembering a few months ago actually it was uh well, what well, doesn't matter. And um, I was on the hot list, like just looking up what um, what shows are going to be coming out. And uh, on the hot list, all that was posted was the first AD. And I thought to myself, okay, screw it. I'm just going to contact them. 
never met them, never worked with them, but it's like, it was just them. And uh, another AD who's been doing uh, uh, AD work for as long as I've been working in the industry, they said, keep in mind that even though the first AD is the only one that's posted on there, it doesn't mean that they, that they don't have the rest of their team figured out because some people may not want to have their names, you know, shown on the hot list. And so I go, oh, okay. But um, they go like, still reach out, you know, like worst case scenario is you come on as either a show caller or as a set PA, and then they get to know you like that. So I reached out, thankfully, they got back to me and said, I haven't even hired the rest of my team yet. So, you know, well, I'll, I will keep you in mind forever interview uh, purposes. And so I go, okay, thanks. Gently. <laughs> I should really follow up with them again, but at the same time, I uh, I've got about five days on um on another sci-fi show around the same time frame that they go to production. So I'm in between like following up about a job and being like, I don't know, should I do it? <laughs> anyway. But, it, uh, and it, it, it's hard, isn't it? It's really hard to kind of put yourself out there, especially when you're not 100% comfortable with that. But do you feel better from doing it? Do, oh, you, do you regret Do you regret it? or? Absolutely not. It was, um, you know, I just reached out. I was nervous. But like you said, stay humble, be honest. And I said exactly that. You know, I've been uh, with the DGC for about three years now. Um, I've you know, worked as a trailer AD a couple of times, like not full time, but you know, I've, I've learned a lot and I will, I think I said, I, I would like to be considered for the trailer AD position and, you know, where I, um, where I don't have a whole lot of knowledge in, I've got people that I can go to, to ask, you know, for help if the people that I'm working with don't have the time on their hands. And, um, so they didn't seem to have a problem with how I worded stuff. It was just more of like, I haven't even hired the rest of my AD team yet. So uh, once I do that, then I'll get back to you. I'm like, okay. Great. Cool. And and do you feel more comfortable doing it again next time? Uh, yeah, it's just um, the only thing that makes me a bit nervous is because I still do background work as well. If I get booked for background work around the same time frame that that show goes to production, mm. it's like, is it worth following up because I've already been booked for, you know, for quite a few continuity days around the same time that they go to your production. So it's like, do I follow up? I don't know. That's <laughs> tough being in the two different departments like that. Right. Like, like you're kind of in an interesting situation that I wonder how many other people in our industry find themselves in, like how many other people are balancing two very different positions, right? Like, I mean, there's, I think there's something we said for slightly between background and ADs, but I mean, th th there's still very different roles and how many other people out there are trying to do that? Cause that's tough. That's hard. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, without giving out the, the name of the show because you know, NDAs and all that jazz. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I went in for a fitting for the show and uh, I was originally booked as human. Um, but then the people that were in charge of the uh, costume fittings to the sci-fi, uh, they knew me from another show and they knew that I was already familiar with wearing prosthetics. And so it was really them that said, we're just going to upgrade you to SSC because you're going to be playing an alien, like wearing prosthetics. And then, or cool. I think they, they asked me, Taylor, do, do you just want to be an alien? And then I couldn't help but go like this. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and so they just, you know, they just did it right there on the spot. And then, um, yeah, so I'm kind of like trying to decide for, you know, a career growth opportunity or, you know, because the industry has been quiet for so long, do I take AD work because it pays a little bit more, especially on sci-fi shows you go into some pretty good overtime. Um, so it's doing that. Um, cause I know for, uh, for, for background work, it's, uh, a lot of people and by people, I mean, background performers, a, a lot of background performers that I've, that I know of, they, they don't mind canceling at the very last minute. And I know that because sometimes I've had to fill in for somebody else who has canceled at the last minute, mm. but it's that whole thing of, um, not wanting to lose the respect, but at the same time, yeah. when you've 
started off a new career essentially in another department and then that opportunity presents itself you're like oh do i do it for the money or do i do it for the career growth opportunity okay it's tough <laughs> and everybody's going to answer that totally different right yeah. and everyone has to do it based off of their own where they're at right there is no right or wrong answer to that it's not one size fits all yeah exactly i mean i still haven't made up my mind but uh it's it's a, i'm i'm of the kind of mindset where i will cross that bridge once i get to it if he yes. does you know respond to me and then we know exact well we know more of what the shooting dates are it'd be really funny if like they start they go to production but like the following week after i've done all, all that background work that would be a That'd be funny and amazing at the same time. It would be. Yes. So, but again, cross that bridge once we get to it. This this question is going to be more of um, when somebody has gotten their very first gig working in the lighting and grip department. I'm going to be using uh, the question that I was taught when I was uh, first being trained to be an AD. And that is when you are, uh, sorry, when you are starting your first gig, like on the actual day, always uh, go to base camp and ask the question, is there anything that I need to know? Because as we both know, every production can run differently, but there still are some similarities. So from your experience, what are some things that you want newcomers to know when they start their first gig as a lighting or grip? person um yeah you know i would i would say a, a lot of times you know people are really intimidated on their first day they're really nervous they're really antsy you know they want to make a good impression you know and they, they generally want to do a a good job and that that's great that's a great attitude to be able to come into doing but you find a lot of times a lot of people might overcompensate uh they might overcompensate because they're nervous they might overcompensate because they're really prideful in the work ethic that they have or who they are or what they've already done in the past you know and i would say for a lot of people once again coming in and having a certain bit of nervousness to it is healthy i think that's really good it keeps you on your toes it keeps you safe you know you're not going to do something that you're not you're not uh willing to, to to not do type of like thing but i would say really for a lot of people it's not uncommon for people to come into the industry not knowing anything so take that into consideration like it, it's it's the industry thrives on people that don't necessarily know too much. So it's okay if you don't don't know that. Type, you don't know everything. That's not going to be expected of you, right? But really, at the end of the day, if 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 your uh, superior or your key asks you to go do something, how are you going to be able to do it, right? Are you going to be able to work independently? Are you going to be able to ask a good question uh, to that person for you to be able to finish finish uh, the job? Are you going to be able to handle the criticism if they uh, say, hey, go and change this, or you did this wrong, please try again type of like thing, right? You're not going to have to go and tell people your, your film uh, history, that you went to film school, that, you know, you've done all this type of stuff like that. Like, honestly, within the first 30 seconds to a minute, your key or, or second is going to know your quality and skill level just by watching watching you it's incredible it's amazing they they've been doing this for so long they'll just know either the way the way you ask a question or the way you do the job they will right away know how much work or effort they need to put into you you don't need to try and brag you don't need to try and tell them all this what you've done or not they're just going to know based off of how you talk and how you do your job so if they're going to know that then just stay quiet ask questions bring your A game, do the best job you can. And if you have to do it again, okay, then humble yourself, do it again. And you know what? Some of the guys are really going to know us, picked it up and be like, I'm going to hire him. I would gladly hire somebody that doesn't know anything. And I have, I've hired people that have zero education in the industry. I've got them almost basically right off the street, but because I know they have a good work ethic and I know they can ask questions. And I know that if they make a mistake, they're not going to take it personally and they're going to move on. Well, that's great. Like that's, 
you have no idea how valuable of a skill set that is. Like it really is a valuable skill set to be able to do that. So I would encourage people that are on uh, looking to get in or even people that like, this is going to be your first, uh, first set that you're going to be on. Um, if you can go in with that attitude, you're, you're going to be far ahead of the rest of the people on their first day as well. But that, but it's a great question to even like, you know, how many people even ask that when they're going into their first day, right? Like, what is it that I don't know? Or what do I even need to ask? What's the question that I need to ask? Like, how many people are even thinking that? So, you know, the fact that you got that so quick is is great. You know, I took it, sounds like, you know, you had, you, you went through a time to be able to get there, but, you know, it's still good that you, you came across that. And now, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, I still do forget to ask that question uh, sometimes. But, you know, like we had said earlier, is that uh, trying to read the room, and if uh, I think I find it helpful if you're told ahead of time that today is going to be chaotic. And so that puts my brain into a mindset of if I have a question that I probably will be able to figure out as the day goes on. It's like, is this question worth asking right now? Or can I just uh, essentially fake it till I make it. <laughs> and um, yeah, but I do find that it is helpful to know ahead of time that, okay, well, today was good, but tomorrow is going to be chaotic because of A, B, and C. And just by knowing that you're like, okay, I'm just going to stick to what I know, try not to make it harder for the people, you know, above me. And um, if I mess something up, then I mess something up. But hopefully the people that I work for, they won't make me feel like crap about it. <laughs> Yep. Yep. That is a tough thing. <laughs> yeah. But that's where like, like, like you said, even if they do make you feel crap, you know, are you able to move past that at the end of the day? Or are you able to redeem to the point where like, you know what, it's water under the bridge at the end of the day. You know, I've, I've, I've personally have been yelled at by people that have set me up to fail. But at the end of the day, we were still able to go out for drinks at the end of it. Right. We were still able to have a coffee or whatever. Right. Back in the day, it was more drinking. But I mean, you know, it was just like that was just it was just in the moment type of thing. Right. And so, you know, really, you know, you get yelled at. It's hopefully we can try not to take it too personally uh, and still be able to be like, OK, water on the bridge. Let's move past it. And uh, can I still get another job out of it? Because at the end of the day, we got to be able to keep working with each other. It's it's not always the best, but we got to try and figure out a way to be able to do it. Yeah. And at least you were able to go out for, for drinks, you know, with those people afterwards, because in, for, uh, in my case, that never happened. And um, even when I find myself like in a conversation with another AD about our experiences on our show calls, how many show calls we've had and like what we've learned and whatnot, um, we will stumble onto that topic of conversation of, um, you know, talking about a really rough third AD that we've uh, worked for in the past. And then they go, oh, uh, what, you know, what show were you working on? I'm like, I don't want to give them a bad rap because <laughs> I don't know if they're saying the same thing about me. Um, but uh, at some point they find out who it is just by me describing their personality. Yes. And, um, and once they find out who it is, it's always funny when they go, they're still working. I'm like, oh, this person, okay. <laughs> I worked for one of those that people are baffled by that they're still working and still with the guild. Um, but uh, when I was working on, again, on Murdoch, um, I was asking a set PA who I know had been doing it longer than, than I had. So I asked her, you know, how many show calls have you had? And then I brought up, uh, yeah, you know, my first show was you know, and I told her the name of the production and she asked me like, who the third AD was. I'm like, oh, it was so-and-so. And she goes, oh. <laughs> and then she was telling me her experiences working or working with, um, uh, with them as well. And we both were like, I can't believe they're still in the industry. It is, isn't it? It's a, it's a, it's incredible. But, and, and that, that's, that's the thing is like, all we have at the end of the day is our personality and our, our and like who we are. Right. And can we work, you know, how do we, how do we portray ourselves at the end of the day? Right. So, you know, you, like I said earlier, you can screw up, you can make mistakes and you're still hired back. It's not unheard of to literally get fired from a film set and then get hired the next day on another production. Right. But that comes down to who they are. Right. Yeah. You might've got fired, 
but that doesn't necessarily totally represent who your, yourself, right? What is everybody else saying around you, right? So uh, uh, it's it's that that story is is, uh, is is still going around and one of many. And I, I agree. I, I feel the same way when I hear a lot of people. They're still working. Will they just hurry up and retire, or you know, or or find a new career or something like that? But we still have to learn to work with them. Yeah, and this is also the same AD who told me that I will be working for other people who will either be worse or they will be around the same level. And they told me it's their way of seeing how much you can take. And I go, okay, well, I'm grateful that they're telling me this aspect of some people out there. And uh, and so I was having another uh, Zoom conversation actually with the with, with an individual who just graduated from the Metropolitan, well, the formerly known Ryerson University. Okay. And um, and so they were feeling a bit nervous slash discouraged because well, the strike didn't help much. But um, they uh, they were trying to find a way to get their foot in the door because they wanted to be both an actor and also a director. And so I told I told them once we stumbled onto this con- this topic of conversation, I go, as a woman in the industry, um, it's gonna happen a few times where you're not so sure if the person that you're working for is being intentionally mean. Or if they are trying to see how tough you are or how tough you can get. And so um, it's like, it's got nothing to do with your, like with your sex, with your ethnicity, or it it doesn't matter any of that. Well, as far as I'm aware of. Um, But uh, that is what a lot of other industry professionals have told me is that this will happen. Again, you will work for other people that are just really rough around the edges to put it nicely yeah yeah to put it nicely and um but honestly sometimes this industry they want to see how much you can take because we see it you know we see it in the papers too and um and it's just really up to you for how you want to work through it and persevere and um and not take it so personally easier said than done of course but absolutely um yeah i uh well i think that's all the the uh, the questions that i have right here um is there anything else you want to add about just the nature or the reality of working in your department um no i think we kind of covered a lot of it like like i was saying before so much of our job is taught on set you know by the people above you or around you so really like you know, we know you know, if it's your first day, your first show, you're not expected to know everything, right? It's more what is your what is your learning style? What is your learning ability? And can you can you take criticism? And how like like you were saying earlier, like how tough is your skin? You know, you're gonna get put into situations that are gonna be hard. How are you gonna handle that? You know, those are the things that we can't teach. You know, that's just who you are and that's who comes to set right i can teach you how to use a c-stand 150 different ways i can show you how to how to how to uh, program dmx lights and stuff like that but you know can i work with you can you work with me can you work with the team you know how how do you work how do you work with uh with everybody and how do you work under stress like really that at the end of the day that's what we're looking for so if you're if you're thinking like you need to know more before you get on set trust me you already know enough if that if you're at that point you already know enough just get out there. Just start getting yourself on set. Just start figuring out the trade itself because you already know enough. Work on the other things that we were just talking about. Right. Yeah. It's um, I mean, I can't think of a single industry that's not tough or even a single job that's not tough. And um, and, and like you said, it's it, it, it's all about how you can handle stress, how you, you can handle, you know, when push comes to shove, when the shit hits the fan and all that jazz, because I, um, I think it was when I was working on Alex Cross, I believe, uh, I forget who said this, but it might have been the first AD who said this. Um, uh, he said, uh, something about we're all on the same team here. We all want to, you know, work as fast as we can, you know, work as quickly as we can. Um, but we still need to, uh, 
maintain the respect that we have for each other. Absolutely. And like, if you don't, you will be called out on it because there's no, there's, there's no reason for that tension. Some ADs do that and others are just kind of like, well, <laughs> Well, we're we're still we're still in a shift, right? Like we're still seeing a lot of the old guard is still around to a certain extent, and with that, they still have certain uh, demands, certain levels of uh, way of doing things, right? Like you know, there are a lot of new, fresh people coming in the industry that are changing that, but we're still in a transition of the old guard to the new guard, you know, and so we're still going to come across that uh, no matter no matter what, uh, you know. I don't think that's going to be for another ten. 10 or so years before everything really kind of shifts away from from that oh yeah it takes a while for things to uh to shift for what the next generation considers for the better um and i the reason i mean the, there's a reason why i say considers is because again everybody works differently everybody has been brought up differently the way that they handle things is very different than the other person um, but I think in the in the grander scale of things is it's just um, uh, I'm looking forward to more sets running in the sense that we are all on the same team and we all don't want to have extremely long days that don't need to be long days. You know, we we just want to have you know we we just want to you know make sure that everything is a hundred percent and that no reach like no reshoots are needed <laughs> and uh yeah but um that'd be a good world to be in yeah i mean i'm i've uh i've worked on enough shows to know that we're heading in that direction but again it's all about the person who's running the floor you know if they uh if there's someone who wants to you know keep it light and you know crack jokes every now and then just to cut the tension and stuff like that or they're the kind of person that enjoys that because it keeps people on their toes or you know putting you know the fear of god into them so to speak yeah um, and uh yeah but um yeah i'm i'm curious to know you know what uh what's going to happen later on down the road because like you said we are seeing a shift right now in the the nature and the reality of set life and mm -hmm. um and like you said from your experiences um the industry has taken a major change in that direction and uh i think you know a, a lot of people might oh, hopefully a lot of people will be happy to hear that being like oh it's not like that anymore phew <laughs> Well, that's why, like, personally, I, I waited so long to be able to join the union in the first place, because I just heard horror stories coming out of the union and being like, well, why do I want to subject myself to that? Why do I want to go and do something like that? It doesn't sound like fun at all, right? It wasn't until things started changing in the union that I even decided to even apply for an ABET 700, right? It was like, okay, well, maybe things have kind of changed. And I was pleasantly surprised at that time. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I think everybody goes through that at some point where you're like, well, I thought I wanted to join this, but now I feel that my mindset's kind of changing. I know I went through that when I was in my early twenties, you know, figuring out like, do I really want to be an AD? You know, I got to try other things. You know, I find there's going to be a strange similarity, but I find that it's no different than dating, you know, like, like you're, you're testing the waters and like for a bunch of different people before you're like, I'm going to still wait before I commit fully to, to someone. It's a very interesting analogy. I have not heard that one. I really like that one. I, it, I might, I might use that one myself. <laughs> like it just came to my head right now. It's like, I'm going to, you know, test the waters, you know, see what else is out there before I make a firm decision. I think somebody else actually said that. And then it made me, it made me laugh pretty hard too, because on a certain level it makes sense um but it's still it's still really funny when you put i think more thought into it than you really need to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um now I, I do need to jump over to another phone call very soon but i, I had uh, was there's two things first of all did you have any other questions for myself or or, or do we go through everything that you were hoping to go through yeah i am um, okay. i everything um and i even went through all the stuff that we did from before um perfect all right well thank you so very much it's always good seeing you we'll see you out there soon and uh, we'll be in touch yep all right bye. take care bye